capacity of... Well, uh, it being 2pm, the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 97. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. The member for Gippsland will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. <coughs> Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to his forecast of $70 billion in debt over the next four years. Can the Prime Minister explain to the House why his one-page legislation rushed into the Parliament in a panic this morning allows his government to increase debt to $200 billion. What is the government holding back from the Australian people? The Prime Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, in answer to the honourable member's question, he'll be familiar with a couple of facts. First is a collapse in government revenues uh, over two periods now, first announced at the time of my EFO where revenues collapsed at $40 billion. Since then, a further collapse of revenues of $75 billion. Secondly, uh, in terms of additional borrowing requirements for the government, there is, of course, uh, the other measures, including enhanced social security payments, which flow from increased unemployment and other associated social security payments. That's the second factor. And the third factor goes to the actual cost of funding the nation-building plan, which the government announced yesterday. If you aggregate the three measures that I've just referred to, it requires borrowing. I would, I would challenge the Leader of the Opposition to identify in this chamber which individual measures of all those referred to he chooses not to support because he knows, as everyone else knows, that in these economic circumstances they can only be financed by borrowing. The member for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister explain to the House the need for the Nation Building and Jobs Plan announced yesterday and its role in addressing the global recession? The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for his question. because It goes to the uh, heart of how this nation responds to a global financial crisis, which is becoming a global economic crisis and in turn a global employment crisis. And as I've said to the House before and will say again, there are two strategic choices for the national leadership of Australia. Either to act and to take a concrete course of action to seek to reduce the impact Order. of this global recession on Australians who did not cause this crisis, or to simply sit on the fence and carp. That, Mr Speaker, represents the alternatives for the leadership of the nation. The Labor government has decided on a course of action. Those opposite have decided to remain firmly sitting on the fence and carp because they have concluded that it is their political advantage so to do. Mr Speaker, on the content of the package that uh, we have put forward, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Education and myself today went out and visited a school, St Gregory's Parish School in Queanbeyan. One of 7,400 primary schools in Australia. 7,400 primary schools in Australia. Catholic independent government right across the country, where this government has resolved to invest, together with the secondary school program and maintenance programs, nearly $15 billion. $15 billion. Mr. Speaker, when I was at St. Gregory's this morning, they outlined to me how they were currently uh, in the business of building a new library resource centre. It's costing them $1.5 million through the renovation of a building that's been there since the 60s. They pointed out to me at that school that uh, they have demountables uh, in which the kids are still studying. And for a school of 600 kids, they have actually no assembly hall, none whatsoever. And when I spoke to the principal, this is a Catholic school. A Catholic school. I spoke to the well. Those opposite just interjected something about state schools. It's a Catholic school, and the principal said, "What we really need in this school is an assembly hall in order to bring the kids together." The stinking hot days on which the um, uh, kids went back to primary school last week, and the d in the depths of winter here in this part of Australia, it's pretty hard to bring the school together in a single place. 
And so what that principal said to me, and I imagine he'll resolve this uh, with the uh, Catholic Education Authority, is that he wants to see projects like that advance within his school. A school of 600 in our neighbourhood, and I was out there this morning with the uh, member for Eden Monero. Can I suggest to those opposite, each one of them, right across the country, each Order. one of the primary schools and each one of your electorates, what you have embarked upon today is to vote against the biggest building program Order. in every primary school in the nation. Every primary school in the nation. In the electorate of North Sydney, in the electorate of Curtin, in the electorate of Wentworth, throughout Adelaide, throughout Brisbane, throughout Queensland, every state of the country, you are voting no against what the school teachers, the PNCs and the PNFs of this nation are demanding. And you are doing so for one reason and one reason alone, and that is rank political expediency. Rank political expediency. Because I suspect that I notice, uh, I notice uh, Higgins up the back has a quiet chortle to himself. I think he knows what my reference is. Because John Higgins has, again, a hungry look uh, when it comes to questions of Liberal Party leadership. Always a backward glance to see what Higgins might be up to. Can I just say this? When the Leader of the Opposition said, uh, in effect, in a statement today, that building school infrastructure was not the highest infrastructure priority of the nation, that's what you think. Ah, so he says, he says that school Order. infrastructure. Order. 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 Mr. Speaker, the House will come so therefore, to order. We have it confirmed from the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Liberal Party, that building school infrastructure is not an infrastructure priority for the nation. That's what he said. Secondly, on the question, on the question Order. of hospitals. Ah, on the question of hospitals, as they twist and as they turn, and have to deal with every PNC and PNF in each of their electorates who come and say, why are you voting against a building program for the primary schools in your electorate? What this Leader of the Opposition then seeks to deflect to is the necessary investment in hospitals. Well, Mr Speaker, the Liberal government talking to us about the priority of investment in hospitals. Twelve Order. years of Liberal government. Twelve years of Liberal government about the priority of investment in public hospitals. I've seen it all. As they gouged one billion dollars out of public hospital expenditure, and within our first year in office, in the meeting of the Council of Australian Governments in this building in December last year, what did we agree on? A $4.8 billion plan with the states and territories to reinvest in public hospitals. A $1.1 billion plan also to invest in the future Order. human resource needs of the health system. Further investment when it comes to emergency services, $750 million. Further investment as well when it comes to $600 million in elective surgery. All these things we have done in one Order. year, and those opposite have the absolute audacity to stand here and challenge whether we regard public hospitals as an infrastructure priority. The truth is, in your 12 years in office, what characterised those opposite? That no infrastructure was a priority, none whatsoever. You ripped and gouged at public hospitals, you failed to invest in our universities, you failed to invest in our TAFEs. And now you refuse to invest in our primary schools. I could say to those opposite, the contrast in terms of nation building is clear. I'd say also to the Leader of the Opposition, his opposition, the Liberal Party's opposition to the biggest nation building, the biggest school modernisation plan for Australia, demonstrates how out of touch he has become. Order. The Liberal Party, out of touch with PNCs, PNFs, mums and dads, seeking to have decent buildings for their kids in primary schools. Out of touch with mums and dads struggling with paying back to school costs. Out of touch with small Member business who want the measures that we Member have foreshadowed Stur. yesterday by way of the accelerated investment allowance. Tradies, carpenters, plumbers, who are desperately seeking for new project work, how out of touch with them and their needs you are. Out of touch with the real needs of Australians, 
Instead, his prescription is this. Stand to one side and allow the Australian people, Australian tradies, mums and dads, to, fa to face and to endure the full brunt of this global economic recession without government stepping in to help. That's the alternative. And um, can I say to the Leader Order. of the Opposition, I, I say to the Leader of the Opposition and to the House that the challenge for the nation at a time of unprecedented global economic challenge is clear cut. Either you act and government intervenes to help stabilise financial markets, to help increase growth, Biden. to help support jobs and to help families deal with the consequences of this global recession, or you vacate the field as recommended by the Liberal Party. This Liberal Party is out of touch with mums and dads, basic needs right across the country. This government will get on with the business of seeking to protect the Australian economy and families as much as is humanly possible from a global economic a recession which they did not cause and which free market fundamentalism has rammed in their direction. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. And I refer to the latest ABS retail trade survey, which showed that seasonally adjusted sales increased by 700 million from November to December. And I asked the Prime Minister what happened to the other $8.9 billion of the cash splash. The Prime Minister. Order. Order. Mr. Speaker, just, ex Order, just occasionally, just Order. occasionally. Order the Prime Minister will resume his seat. <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, occasionally, just occasionally, there's a question from the Liberal Liberal Party which really takes your breath away. <laughs> really takes your breath away. Uniquely across this nation, across the world, in, the t in what has happened to the global economic crisis, we have positive news in terms of retail sales in December, and those opposite want to simply cry foul and say they're not good enough. Across the world, retail collapsed in December. In the United States, there was a massive collapse in retail stores. You saw it also in the data I referred to from um, Westfield yesterday in New Zealand. We produce not just, of course, the figures which came from Westfield yesterday and also the figures which have been produced from other sources as well, but the retail sales data again produced officially today demonstrates that we had, through the measures provided by the government uh, at the end of last year, investment by consumers in consumption which helped support uh, all those businesses employing people out there in the retail sector. Those opposite, those opposite who claim from time to time, depending on the season, to stand up for the interests of small business, fail to understand how much small business is concentrated in the retail sector. Are you seriously saying to the government that the investment which we made through that uh, allocation to families at the last year, the impact which it's had on retail sales, and the flow-through effect which that has had, the flow-through effect which that has had to the small business sector in the retail uh, businesses of the country, is of no consequence. Well, can I just say it demonstrates one thing: those opposite have embarked upon a campaign of negativity, negativity, negativity. We are in the business of embarking upon a positive course of action to see the nation through, and the Leader of the Opposition Order, the should think assume, better of the retail— Prime Minister, assume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, we would like the Prime Minister to engage in a campaign of relevance, relevance, relevance. Order. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Has the Prime Minister concluded his answer? The Prime Minister has concluded his answer. The The member for Page. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Would the Deputy Prime Minister please update the House on reaction to the government's $14.7 billion building the education revolution? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question and know how interested she is in the circumstances of schools in her electorate. Uh, can I say, Mr. Speaker, that we have had reaction to the announcement yesterday from all of those who are in touch with the needs of Australian schools, those who work in schools, those whose children go to schools, those who represent schools in the public debate. Those in touch with the needs of Australian schools have, of course, welcomed the government's historic Building the Education Revolution package and its historic $14.7 billion investment in primary schools, special schools, schools that service primary and secondary students together, K-12 schools and into secondary schools. And to give you just a flavour of the responses, Mr Bill Daniels, who represents the Independent Schools Council, welcomed this substantial investment in capital infrastructure and said it would greatly benefit school communities across Australia. The president of the Australian Primary Principals Association, Leonie Trimper, said, and I quote, uh, the announcement is fantastic news for Australia's 7,500 primary schools. This is fantastic win-win for all Australians. It is a lasting investment in Australia's future, our primary students. And I could, of course, go on to a host of other supportive comments, but perhaps the sentiment was best caught by Mr Bill Bird, the principal of Kingsgrove Public School, who was quoted in today's Australian. He described the package as brilliant and said he looked forward to replacing the demountable library which had been there after the original building burnt down several years ago. He said, and I quote, it will give a new sense of permanence and purpose. This is extremely important. Not only that, it will result in an environment that is actually conducive to learning. These are the voices of people who are in touch with the needs of schools. Then, unfortunately, Mr Speaker, we've also heard the voices of those who are completely out of touch with the needs of schools. First and foremost, the Leader of the Opposition, who uh, in his contribution earlier today asked rhetorically, is the most urgent infrastructure deficiency requirement in Australia primary school assembly halls and libraries? Well, I suggest he walk into any school in this country and talk to the principal, talk to the teachers, talk to the uh, parents of children in that school and ask them what they think is important to the future of this nation and what they will say is important to the future of this nation is having a 21st century education system that invests in primary school students. And the Leader of the Opposition wants to play some funny game about priorities. Well, the government is very proud to say we think this nation's priority is its children. We think this nation's hot prize priority is the next generation of Australians our highest priority for economic prosperity, our highest priority for equity. We will unashamedly say that in every school in this country, and presumably members of the Liberal Party will be walking in the door to say kids aren't a priority, because that's what the Leader of the Opposition believes. And of course, the Leader of the Opposition wasn't the only Liberal voice putting this position. We had the member for Higgins describing this 14.7 billion dollar investment in Australian schools as a poor quality spend. Well, the only poor quality in relation to this announcement is the completely out of touch reaction of the Leader of the Opposition and his Liberal Party. They don't understand the importance of schools to Australia's future. They don't understand the importance of a first class education for Australian school students to this nation's future. 
they are completely out of touch with principals, with teachers and with parents and with all those Australians who care about our future and most particularly <coughs> care about the education of Australia's kids. Order, order. Before I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, as the mention of young Australians sent the House slightly haywire, I think it's perhaps appropriate that at this time I welcome the young Australians from regional and rural communities that are here for the Haywire Youth Issues Forum. Of course, Haywire is an initiative of, the a of ABC Radio. On behalf of members, I welcome them to the House and wish them all the best with their activities throughout the week. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, the government forecasts economic growth of 3 per cent in 2011-2012 and is forecasting to run a deficit of $25.7 billion in that year. Can the Treasurer explain to the House how the government intends to maintain a budget surplus over the economic cycle while it has plans to run a huge deficit in a year of average growth. The Treasurer. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Speaker. The uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition just can't get it right. We project, we project trend growth in that year. We don't forecast it in that year. Let's be very, very clear about that. This is this is, there's a very, very big difference. This is a very important time in the history of this nation. Order. One's a projection, Order. the other has been modelled, of course. Order. Now, now, Mr Speaker, the economic illiteracy of those opposite is just truly stunning. For the first time, Mr Speaker, for the first time in the history of this country, we have had a major political party and its leader come into this House and say, that they intend to deliberately vote for higher unemployment. That is, that is exactly, order. That is exactly the what they have to said. Order. The Treasurer resumed his seat. Order. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Apart from the offensive nature of that allegation, Mr Speaker, order. on a point of relevance. Order. Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. I ask the Treasurer to come back to the point about how they will maintain a budget surplus over the economic cycle Order. when they are forecasting Order. in the a Deputy year Leader of, the of assumed will resume average growth. The Treasurer will respond to the question. Treasurer. Uh, certainly, uh, Mr Speaker. And the Opposition doesn't believe that we need an economic stimulus despite the fact that there has been Order. such a substantial contraction in demand, Mr Speaker. They don't, think, they don't think, for example, Order. that we need bonus payments Order. targeted at lower income earners, targeted at lower income earners to boost consumption precisely at the time that this country needs it, when the world is doing the worst that it can possibly throw at us. What this government is going to do is to act to support jobs. And to do that, we do need to have a temporary deficit. And that is provided for in the Ford estimates. And our commitment to fiscal rigour over the long term remains. And we have made it very clear in the document, in the, U the UEFO, that we intend to return to surplus as soon as we possibly can. Consistent. Uh, Order. Mr Speaker, it sounds order. like all of those opposite know the date that world global conditions are going Member to normalise. Do you know that date? Of course you don't. Of course you Member don't. For Monk so Reef. when growth returns to trend terms, we will begin to move back to surplus. That is the responsible <coughs> thing to do. And of course, moving back to surplus would not be helped by the approach of those opposite. Because we've had the deputy leader of the opposition suggest the way to get future growth and future tax revenue is to give even bigger tax cuts. She said that bigger permanent tax cuts would increase revenue. Well, we would suggest that's a recipe for higher and higher deficits and higher 
and higher borrowing. That's exactly what it is. And of course, it's interesting to look at what the Leader of the Opposition has had to say about her position on this. This is what he, uh, he had to say this morning on ABC Radio. Interviewer, can you explain Julie Bishop's suggestion on the weekend that you can increase your tax revenue by cutting your tax tape? Mr Turnbull, well, this is a, this is a, a, a point. It's like a lot of economic uh, points. It has merit, but it isn't right, you know, in, a, in an extreme the form. The Treasurer Jimmy seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to save the Treasurer from himself here. Mr. Speaker, he was asked a question: uh, if he believes he is keeping to his own formula, why is the government projecting 3% growth? And yet, running a $25.7 billion dollar the, deficit. The manager of opposition business resume his seat. The treasurer will respond to the question. I'll be listening very closely to the treasurer. Treasurer, Mr. The Speaker. So the interviewer went on. Do you agree with Julie Bishop, Mr. Turnbull? Well, it, 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 it. I All simply, right. rather than the treasurer I'm not going his to, seat. To, the treasurer resume his seat. The Treasurer will resume his seat. Treasurer! Treasurer! The Treasurer will resume his seat. The... the member for O'Connor on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. Whilst recognising the limitations upon yourself in terms of the answering of a question, it is still required to be relevant, and a question asked about the government's business and the government's budget hardly requires reading to this parliament some interview that was conducted Order. in the, on the radio. Order. I don't care who it was. Order. I'm the telling you, let him answer the question, Order. even the if it's with his escape clause. will resume his seat. The interjectors will stop interjecting. The member for O'Connor will ignore the interjections. <laughs> there is a there is a character that has a name in common with me that has a saying, "Make my day," but I'm not going to. All right. <laughs> I will be listening very carefully to the Treasurer's response. There are difficulties, as I said yesterday, with the way in which uh, the House has allowed this type of uh, material to be used in answers, which I have a problem with because it is bordering on debate, which is not allowed in the formulation of a question, but the traditions of the House have allowed it. I will listen carefully to the uh, Treasurer's response. The Treasurer has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I was merely making the point that the opposition Order. has a policy to send the budget into deeper deficit permanently. Permanently. And what we are doing with a targeted stimulus is to support jobs right now when they're needed, Mr Speaker. And of course, we've made the point and we've made it publicly. Uh, in the documentation that we published yesterday, that as soon as the economy reco recovers, as soon as the economy grows above trend, the government will take action to return the budget to surplus. That is as it should be. The member for Melbourne Ports. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the retail trade figures released this morning and their implications? The Treasurer. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan that we oh, announced no. uh, yesterday, and of course the economic security strategy that we put in place uh, last October, do demonstrate how Australia can get through this global recession in better, in better shape than most other advanced economies, because we can use our strengths. We can use our strengths in fiscal policy and monetary policy to to stimulate demand in this economy and to support jobs. And that is precisely uh, what we are doing. 
and it's precisely the intention that was precisely the intention of the economic security strategy last October. And if these retail trade figures today demonstrate anything, they demonstrate how out of touch the leader of the opposition is and his entire front bench is from what is actually happening in Australia. Because contrary to the Orwellian language of the leader of the opposition earlier, what these retail trade figures show is that the economic security strategy gave a significant boost to demand in December last year. A significant boost to demand in December last year, supporting employment, supporting employment particularly in the retail sector. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The December retail trade figures show that retail sales increased by 3.8 per cent in December. You know, that's the biggest monthly increase since August 2000. But consider the backdrop to this, Order. because it goes Order to the, the, the core of the inaccuracy of what the opposition has been saying in this place over the last 48 hours. Because the, the backdrop to this Bowman. is the sharpest contraction in global demand in December seen in the history of the modern market economy. And in other countries around the world, what you saw was substantial falls in retail sales. And if you go through them in the US, retail sales fell by 2.7 per cent in the month of December. In Japan, sales fell by 2 per cent in December. In Germany, they fell by 1.2 per cent. And in the UK, they fell by 1 per cent. And it's also instructive to look at the data as to where the sales were biggest or where they increased the most, because there is this uh, allegation from, from the other side that Australian families are out there wasting it. That's the implication of what they're saying. Let's just look at where it was spent. Department stores, an increase of 8.3 per cent. Clothing, 5.8 per cent. Other member household for goods, 9.9 per cent. And this is occurring in the midst of the carnage on global stock markets, the collapse in demand and growth right around the world. This is a very substantial achievement, and it has been a very big boost to employment in this economy at a critical time for so many Australian families. And I would say it certainly demonstrates the wisdom of the government's approach in targeting our assistance, particularly to those who are credit constrained and who are on lower incomes. And it demonstrates why most of the economists around the world and most of the official bodies back our view that making these payments to people who are credit constrained and on lower incomes and doing it in a lump sum works. It works. And of course, we, we, we get this from the IMF most particularly. If we could just uh, look at what John Lipsky has had to say on the 17th of no November. He's uh, the deputy chief of the IMF, the former chief economist. For example, measures to support low income households would be particularly helpful in boosting demand and would be targeted at those most in need or even go to the Business Council of Australia and their budget submission. And I could go on and on, quoting economists around the world, Member including Nobel laureates, who provide a very sensible source of advice, which common sense tells you is correct, that if you target your support at those who need the assistance most, then their propensity to spend will be highest. And, of course, that is the orthodox position. It is not the position, of course, articulated by the Leader of the Opposition or by the Deputy Leader uh, of the Opposition. And it now brings us to this point, and it's very important to consider it in this light. By refusing to support the package that we have brought forward and being so critical of the consumption measures that we have put in this package, if they were successful in their endeavours, they would leave a gaping hole in our economic defences a gaping hole against the contraction in demand that is occurring on a global basis. And this government does not intend for that to happen. We, we are intent on putting in place this, this uh, jobs plan, this package to support employment in the Australian economy for Australians right now. And anyone who won't support it is simply supporting higher unemployment and is utterly irresponsible. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, uh, is, or is the Prime Minister aware of reports that over 90 per cent of National Australia Bank mortgage customers 
are still paying above their monthly minimum repayments. In other words, mortgage holders are paying down their debt rather than taking the savings and interest rate reductions. Given this pattern of saving by householders, how can the Prime Minister be confident that his cash handouts will be spent and not saved by nervous householders? Order, the Prime Minister. The Prime um, Minister resume his seat. Prime Minister resume his seat. The member for Bowman will leave the chamber for one hour under 94A. The order. The member for Banks. Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the honourable member for North Sydney for his question. And, uh, it does uh, bring back into stark relief the um, Leader of the Opposition's uh, proclamation of the Turnbull Doctrine yesterday that the thing about money is you either spend it or save it, um, <laughs> those essentially representing the two strategic <coughs> options uh, which are available. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, this government is not in the business and can never be in the business of forcing any individual consumer or taxpayer to deploy their funds in a particular way. Uh, what we can do, however, is assist the family budget by the practical measures that we outlined last year in the economic security strategy and, again, as a part, or one quarter of, in fact, uh, the nation-building plan that the government released yesterday. If individual uh, households and consumers elect to spend, then, of course, that directly assists sectors of the economy, such as retail, but other sectors as well, and therefore that supports employment directly. That is why there is such a strong body of uh, advice from organisations around the world as to the virtue in employment terms of such measures. Secondly, however, if consumers elect to save in part, as many of them will, then that can have the effect of then offsetting later decisions to return to spending. I'll give you a practical example. If someone is now electing, for example, to take part of the $950 cash bonus to make a temporary down payment or a temporary reduction in their credit card bill. That's a matter for them. But if that is their decision anyway, what that provides is a greater opportunity for that person to, re to return to other levels of spending a little later on. These things do not exist as stark alternatives to each other. That is why a proper and rational response to the global economic recession and its impact on Australia is to have an entire armoury of measures those designed to support uh, households, those designed to support consumption, those designed to support private residential construction, hence the first home buyers boost of last year, hence many of the construction related initiatives we announced yesterday, including the one off extraordinary investment of into 20,000 units of social housing. That is why you must also embrace as part of your strategy encouragement of business to resume decisions on private fixed capital investment, hence our decisions to bring in uh, an accelerated temporary investment allowance. And on top of that, why we must also uh, push the uh, throttle into fast forward in the direct government investment in critical public infrastructure like schools, like roads and uh, other elements of transport and related infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, a rational response to the impact of the global recession on the Australian economy must embrace all elements that I've just referred to. It's not one or the other. That is the only way in which we can reduce the impact of this global recession on Australia. The alternative, as the member for North Sydney knows full well, is simply to let the free market rip. That's the alternatives that the Australian people are confronted with. Our strategy is clear. The member for Braddon. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on how the government's nation, national building and jobs plan will support Australian families such as those in my electorate of Braddon and of any responses? The Minister for Family, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Braddon uh, for his question and for the very hard work that he uh, does for the families in his uh, electorate in that part of Tasmania. Mr Speaker, yesterday there was uh, some new hope for Australian families. Mums and dads 
could breathe just a little easier with the announcement of the government's $42 billion nation building and jobs plan. It is uh, an economy boosting plan from a government that is determined to take the decisive action needed to support families and jobs. And under the plan, 8.7 million taxpayers get a tax bonus of up to $950. 2.7 million school-aged children attract a $950 back-to-school bonus. 1.5 million single-income family households get a $950 single-income family bonus. And families relying on the housing and construction sectors could feel a little more confident knowing that 21,000 jobs were going to be supported by the government's investment in uh, the social housing sector—$6.4 billion of investment. But now what we see from the opposition leader is that he wants to kill that hope and confidence of Australian families. He doesn't care about the millions of jobs, the millions of jobs under threat if families don't get these tax bonuses and payments. He doesn't care about stopping support for the 21,000 jobs in the housing and construction uh, sector. So every single time, every single time an Australian parent loses their job, Every single time, the opposition leader will need to answer to those parents about why it is that he's opposing this nation-building and jobs plan. Now, all of us on this side of the House, and I think many other Australians, know exactly why the leader of the opposition is doing this, for base political purposes, no other. I have to say uh, it must be a pretty it must be a pretty lonely place over there because from the business council right through to Anglicare they all understand why it is that uh, this uh, plan needs to be supported. The opposition has got this gravely and dangerously wrong, gravely and dangerously wrong. And just this morning, as the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have said so clearly today, we've got the final nail in the opposition leader's coffin with the uh, retail sales figures up by 3.8 per cent. The Leader of the Opposition might not have noticed these are the biggest monthly increases since August 2000. The figures don't lie. The economic strategy payments in December did their job, and he should now make sure he supports the government's actions in our $42 billion package so that people can keep their jobs. The member for Casey. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer point to a country where a stimulus package providing one-off payments to families and individuals has successfully created jobs? Australia. <laughs> Order. The Treasurer. Treasurer. Order. The House will come to order. Uh, Mr Speaker, they're so out of touch they don't know what country they're living in. I can point to the success of the economic security Order. strategy. I can point Order. to the success of the economic security strategy of last October in Australia. And I can and I can say I can say to the honourable member that the overwhelming research work that has been done around the world by the expert bodies studying this matter over the years most notably the International Monetary Fund, is absolutely unambiguous in its recommendation for our approach. But, you know, it's not only, it's not only people like uh, Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate, it's not only a large body of economic opinion, not only in the United States and Britain, but it's also shared by many people in this country. So could I just quote from a recent budget submission uh, given to the government? It says this. Measures most likely to immediately impact demand are direct purchases of goods and services by government and or transfers directed to members of the community with a high propensity to spend. Now, who would have that come from? Could that have come from the ACTU, maybe? Maybe. It came from the Business Council of Australia. Mr. Speaker. 
because this is accepted wisdom. The only place it's not accepted is by those opposite who are so terminally out of touch they can't see the urgency involved here and the need to support Australian jobs and Australian industry. The member for Petrie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the economic benefits of the Nation Building and Jobs Plan and why it is so important the plan can be implemented as soon as possible? The Treasurer. Yes, Mr Speaker. Look, it's very important that this uh, legislation passes the House this week. Uh, we have been advised by the Tax Commissioner and also by the Chief Executive of Centrelink that we do need key legislation through this House if the payments are to proceed through Centrelink in March and if the tax bonuses are to be paid uh, by the Tax Office in April. That is just a fact. And given the urgency of what is occurring internationally, it is very important that there is no undue delay. Now, I've seen the Leader of the Opposition today talk about what we should be doing instead, for example, of providing uh, the tax bonus and some of the other payments. And he suggests that what we should do instead is bring forward the 2009-10 tax cuts. That was one suggestion yesterday. Now, of course, if you were to take the Leader of the Opposition's suggestion, that would deliver $150 to a taxpayer on $30,000. Only $150. There's no stimulus there. That is $800 less than our tax bonus that we will deliver in April. If you're talking about someone on $65,000, he only wants to deliver in that period $150. Once again, $800 less than the tax bonus that we will deliver in April. Now, of course, he would deliver, through his proposition, $2,150 to a taxpayer on $200,000. And that's a real indicator of the priorities of the Leader of the Opposition. Now, I think because I pointed out this mistake to him yesterday, he changed his tune in the House today. And I think in the House today he suggested that they would be in favour of bringing forward the tax cuts from 2010-11. I think that's what he said in the House today. Now, if his proposal were to be adopted, that would result in $300 to a taxpayer on $30,000, $650 less than the bonus that we would provide in April. But for somebody on $200,000, that would deliver $3,450 to that taxpayer. $3,450 more than they would receive through our temporary bonus. But it is worse than that. It is worse than that, uh, Mr. Speaker, because it goes to the point that I made to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition earlier, because they are arguing in favour of permanent tax cuts. If the proposition was put and implemented by the Leader of the Opposition to bring forward the 10 11 uh, tax cuts, the Leader of the Opposition's proposed tax bring forward would cost $11 billion, $11 billion, $11 billion on a permanent basis. Hence my observation earlier that they are in favour of higher deficits permanently. The Leader of the National Party. Mr Speaker, my question is also to the Treasurer. And I refer the, uh, the Treasurer to weekend newspaper reports that $81 million from the government's first spending package went to recipients living permanently overseas. <laughs> Treasurer, how did these payments overseas stimulate the Australian economy? The Treasurer. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, I think, uh, I think the member has a very short memory. Uh, it is the case that we do have reciprocal social security agreements with other countries, and payments are made to Australians living overseas, and uh, residents of other countries have payments Order. made to their residents living here. And Order. I do have a long memory, because I have, a, I have, a, I have a, me a memory of a time when the member who asked the question Order. was actually a minister for social security in this House. And I think you'll find he might have negotiated some of those agreements. <laughs> 
order. I think that's the case. I think that's the case. And he was certainly a member of a government that was that was negotiating the order. current arrangements that apply now and have always applied under both sides of politics. The member for Hasluck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. How will the government's nation building and jobs plan improve road safety and stimulate local economies? The Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Hasluck for her question and her ongoing issue, in go, ongoing interest in, in uh, transport, in transport and infrastructure development, including in her electorate. The package that is before the House today <coughs> provides an additional $90 million for the Black Spots program. The Black Spots program improves safety right around the nation. For every dollar spent, there is a far greater saving due to the fall in costs in terms of uh, health costs from accident reduction and in terms of efficiencies on our roads. This will fund an additional 350 projects. It brings spending on black spots to over $250 million over the next two years, more than double more than double what the former government was planning to spend over the same period. Now we're also providing an additional an additional $150 million for repairing and maintaining regional roads. In order to do all this, of course, we need to get the package that is before the House passed. Now you would expect you would expect the National Party to at least be supporting regional road projects. If nothing else, you would expect them to be supporting that. But you had, of course, you had, of course, the leader of the National Party has already made his contribution to this debate, the Shadow Minister for Transport, and he's dismissed the $150 million. He has dismissed it. Indeed, he has spend, so called it a paltry effort. He has said you could spend all of that on one road in my electorate and you still would not have caught up on the maintenance backlog just for that road. Who was the minister? Who was the minister who presided over the maintenance backlog? Who was the minister for transport in the former government? He and his national colleagues presided over presided over massive cuts in road funding, including including a cut of 35 per cent in 2005-06, it was $4.3 billion, down to $2.8 billion in 06 7 A cut of 35 per cent in road funding. But so out of touch are they with uh, people that they used to be a part of uh, their constituency that they, engaged, that they engaged in. So out of touch are they. This is what people in the sector have had to say about the package put forward under the Nation Building and Jobs Program. Wendy Machen, president of the NRMA, said yesterday, the NRMA warmly welcomes this additional funding, particularly the fact that a substantial proportion of the money will be immediately available to be spent this financial year. Trevor Martin of the Australian Trucking Association said, we are very pleased the government has looked beyond tomorrow's headlines and is putting money into fixing the roads and making them safer. Every road user will benefit from the government's plan. The fact is that the opposition are just so out of touch. It is all about themselves. It's all about the politics. The Leader of the Opposition is more concerned with protecting his own position as Leader of the Opposition than he is with defending the interests of the nation. So that the default position, the default position because his party room is just so divided as to come in here and simply say, we'll oppose the whole package. Well, they stand, they stand condemned 
They stand isolated from their own oh, base. The they stand turn. isolated from their own communities. And over coming days, weeks and months, there will be the a real political Pistur. price to pay for their political opportunism of the Leader of the Opposition. The member for Stirling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Education and Social Inclusion. I refer the Deputy Prime Minister to yesterday's updated economic outlook, which forecasts a loss of 300,000 Australian jobs. How can the Deputy Prime Minister reconcile that loss of jobs with the government's claims that its recent spending packages will create or support 330,000 jobs? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, Shadow Minister for his question. And the answer to the Shadow Minister's question is, in fact, obvious. The government is engaged in the economic security strategy in this nation building and jobs plan to promote economic activity and to support jobs. And as the Prime Minister has said on as the Prime Minister has Order. said on more than one occasion, we are in difficult times. We are in difficult times. But what we can certainly say about the economic security Order. statement and about this nation building and jobs plan is that it will support economic growth and consequently support jobs. And whilst we are in difficult economic times, Order. clearly Clearly, the nation will be in a better position with this stimulus in our economy than if the nation followed the lead of the Leader of the Opposition and the members of the Liberal Party, who Farrell. have taken a conscious decision today to come into this parliament and to vote for higher unemployment, to come into this parliament and vote against nation-building propositions, including, including the biggest historic spend on our schools in this nation's history. That is what the Liberal Party has chosen to do. The Treasurer during the course of question time has taken the Liberal Party to the evidence from the retail trade figures about the difference that the economic security strategy made. And if members of the Liberal Party are so economically naive, so economically incompetent, that they can't reason from those figures into understanding that stimulus packages make a difference to economic activity and stimulus packages consequently make a difference and support <coughs> jobs, then really I do wonder what hope there is for them. And I would have to say Order. to the Leader of the Opposition the that if he can't explain that basic economics to his front bench, one does wonder what skills you needed to have to be a merchant banker. Order. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Will the Minister advise the Government's Order. nation building and jobs plan will maximise support for jobs? And why is a temporary stimulus through targeted payments and investment a better mechanism for supporting economic growth and jobs rather than tax cuts for the higher income earners? The Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Government's nation building and jobs plan is designed to push back hard against the very powerful negative economic forces emerging from overseas that are causing major problems for the Australian economy and at the same time leave a legacy of new and upgraded infrastructure for the future of Australians. The individual payments that we are committed to will hit the Australian economy first in March and April but continue to flow through for some months thereafter because people may in some cases save initially and then spend subsequently. The investment in insulation of Australian homes, in schools, in housing will ensure that we rebuild the infrastructure of this nation, both the community infrastructure and the productive infrastructure, for the benefit of future generations. And it's legitimate to ask, Mr Speaker, what exactly would across-the-board tax cuts favouring wealthy people, permanent tax cuts, do for future generations in terms of productive infrastructure and community infrastructure? How are they going to improve the productivity of this nation? Now, yesterday, Mr Speaker, I reminded the House 
of the infamous Order. statement by the member for Curtin on Sunday, where she advised that the coalition's response was, quote, broad and sweeping tax cuts that will increase the tax base and increase tax revenues. Now, as I've already pointed out, this is based on the discredited theories of Professor Arthur Laffer that if you actually cut taxes, that will mean tax revenues grow. And I note the Leader of the Opposition's response to that in a radio interview where he stumbled, Order. he bumbled, he weaved, he ducked. Order. He was unable to avoid actually sort of saying, well, I kind of agree sometimes with his own deputy leader, his own shadow treasurer. There was lots of, well, it, 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 and simply this, and I'm not going to. And Minister of Finance, resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, this is like Groundhog Day. Mr. Speaker, except that the second order. time round, it's far more presentable. Order. I would ask you to bring him back to the question that he was asked by his own order. side. Order. The I'm listening closely, and the uh, question asked for a uh, the comment on target and uh, targeted and uh, tax cuts, and that's I think what the minister's doing. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There is another element in the statement by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that warrants some examination too, and that is the reference to, quote, increase the tax base. Now, increase the tax base means one thing, and that is you start taxing things that currently aren't taxed. That's what the former government did by introducing the GST. That's what increase the tax base actually means, Mr. Speaker. And I note that the opposition Order. that is today making such, a, such an emphasis on the issues of deficit is, such a, is, is saying that its alternative strategy, its alternative strategy outlined this morning by the Leader of the Opposition, involved a stimulus package Order. of $15 billion, $15 billion minimum. And when asked on radio in Perth Dixon. today, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was asked if you were going to spend $15 billion in a recovery package, would that send the Australian economy into deficit? And her answer was, quote, it would balance it, in fact, at this point. Now, not only has she not caught up with the collapse in government revenues that the, the Prime Minister announced on Monday, a $115 billion collapse in revenues, but even if you measure this against the projections in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook papers published in mid-November, you would see that this statement is 100 per cent wrong. She cannot even add up. She cannot even add up, Mr Speaker, because that stimulus package they proposed would take the, the budget into deficit, even without the recent updated analysis of the collapse in tax revenues, Mr Speaker. Now, the statements from the Deputy Leader lead to one of two conclusions, Mr Speaker. Either the opposition has a strategy to impose new taxes, perhaps broaden the GST, put it back on food where it always wanted to do, or, or she has absolutely no idea what she's talking about. Those are the two options, Mr. Speaker. Now I concede, I concede, Mr. Speaker, that there is quite a bit of evidence to support the second hypothesis. There is quite a bit of evidence to support that hypothesis. But having been in this place for a while, I'm a bit of a cynical type. I'm a bit more suspicious. I tend to believe in politics that where there's a little bit of smoke, there's going to be fire, Mr. Speaker. Where there's some smoke, and I note with interest that late January she also said that one of the first things the, oppos the opposition would do in response to the global financial crisis is revisit industrial relations laws. I wonder what that's a reference to. Now I believe in watching what people do, watching what people do in politics. And what we've really seen hinted at by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and, and walked away from to a degree for public presentation purposes by the Leader of the Opposition is the real traditional Liberal Party strategy, which is tax cuts for the wealthy, increase the GST's scope and bring back work choices. That is the strategy of the Opposition. Now, the government rejects these approaches. The government rejects these approaches, Mr Order. Speaker, because Order. we are investing in the long-term infrastructure needs of this nation. We are getting spending moving into the pockets of ordinary families to ensure that the retail sector, the ordinary small business of this country can continue to grow and to sustain employment, to sustain jobs and growth. The member for Sturt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer the Prime Minister to his No Child Shall Be Without a Computer between Year 9 and 12 and a Trades Training Centre for Every Secondary School promises at the last election. Given that the free-falling Computers in Schools program has doubled to $2 billion, 
and only 34 trades training centres have been approved for Australia's 2,650 secondary schools, what confidence can the Australian people possibly have that yesterday's promises for schools will be any less hollow? The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the government stands unapologetically for an education revolution in Australia. I thought that would get him going. An education revolution in terms of what we build in our schools, our primary schools, our secondary schools, our TAFEs, our universities and in our research. And the reason we believe in that is because we need to equip this nation for the 21st century economy. I said yesterday that when I said at the last election that we needed to prepare for that day when the mining boom was over, those opposite, when they were in government, scoffed and laughed. That was a little more than a year ago. Guess what? The mining boom's over. And what you did for 12 years was to turn your back on developing the knowledge base of the economy to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. And if it's escaped the attention of the member for Skirt, Sturt, in, in, midst of his, um, in the midst of his, um, well, I think he must have an interesting set of arrangements at the moment in terms of his loyalties between the member for Wentworth and the member for Higgins. Well, just think about that for a minute. Order. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Sturt on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the question was very specifically about the hollow promises made at the last election and their failure to be delivered. It was about outcomes, order. not rhetoric. Order. The, the Prime Minister should Sturt be brought back to the question. Seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. Prime Minister is responding to the question, the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And a key part of the education revolution is to ensure that our kids have access to the digital education revolution of the 21st century. That means that all kids, not just those in the richest and flashiest schools, but all kids have an opportunity to participate in the information economy of tomorrow. And that means that we've got to work hard to do it. What the, those opposite, when they had 12 years to act, did was simply push it all into too hard basket. Nothing happened on high-speed broadband. Nothing happened in terms of a rollout of effective computer access within our schools. Uh, when it comes to trades training centres in schools, as we have gone around the country, we've seen capital works or capital infrastructure in our secondary schools, which hasn't been updated for 30 or 40 years. This is a disgrace. We need to invest it to fix it. And what we've sought to do, adding to that with the nation building plan which we outlined yesterday, was to add language laboratories, to add also science wings in our primary schools, 21st century libraries, also multi purpose halls. This is part of building the best education system that this nation can possibly have. And we will honour our pre election com commitments on trades training centres and on computers in <laughs> schools as given. Order. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade. How will Australia's trade policy enhance the economic impact of the government's nation building and jobs plan? The Minister for Trade. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his quest her question and make the point that the um, global financial crisis is having a huge impact of trade on trade flows around the world, and despite the fact that Australia posted a strong surplus yesterday, trade surplus yesterday, we won't be immune. And the reason for that is that six out of our top ten trading partners are already in recession. We've got the IMF forecasting that trade flows will decline this year by 2.8%. And we are seeing very worrying trends in terms of reversion to protectionist policies, most evidenced by the dairy decision in the EC and the Buy America campaign uh, emanating from the US Congress, both uh, measures which we have strongly opposed. But because we're not immune, uh, Mr Speaker, it's the reason that we as a government here have to act decisively, as well as in international fora, in arguing and taking action for a positive and constructive path forward. And that's why yesterday's $42 billion jobs and nation building package 
is an essential part to our response, not just for what matters here in the country, but in terms of a global call for those countries that are in a position to spend and inject the fiscal stimulus to do so. And the IMF has called for countries that are in that position to spend at least 2 per cent into their GDP. Yesterday, of course, we also saw the Reserve Bank responding not just to the circumstances here but to the urgings again of banking authorities for the um, central banks to ease interest rate pressures. And it's also the reason that our endeavours in the international fora to free up trade is so important to this coordinated approach. The reason for that is simple, Mr Speaker, because trade itself is a stimulus. And that's because world trade has historically grown faster than world output. And each time that there's been a successful conclusion to a trade round, that multiplier has increased. So the point that we make, Mr Speaker, is this. What is the point? What is the point in the coordinated approach to fiscal stimulus unless you're prepared to work on the multiplier as well? And that's why we have been advocating the conclusion of the Order. Doha round, not just in the Order. forums of the WTO, but through, but the, through the G20. Now, Mr Speaker, this is a government that has responded and acted in terms of the coordinated action. But who's standing against that action in this country? Those that sit opposite. Because what they would do was to oppose the stimulus message and the stimulus call that the international organisations have called for and to which Australia has responded. Their action is irresponsible. It doesn't just fly in the face of what's being called for globally, but it condemns Australian working families to the worst excesses of what will happen out of this global recession. The member for Dixon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Would the minister outline the government's, how the government's spending package will provide relief to patients and doctors in hospitals around the nation, including the Dubbo Hospital, where doctors haven't been paid since October and regular maintenance, pr maintenance programs are not being undertaken? Why won't the minister deliver on the government's promise to fix public hospitals? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his question because it allows us to take the opportunity to remind the House about the very significant investments that have already been made in health in the last 14 months. Right. In, contrast, in contrast to the approach taken by the previous government, which used to rip money out of the public hospital system. So let me just recap in case any members over the Christmas break have forgotten about the $64 billion Order. of health investment, for a 50 per cent increase on the previous government in this health care agreement. Order. I don't hear anybody saying that a 50 per cent increase on the previous government's health care agreement is an underinvestment in health. I didn't hear any criticism about $1.1 billion going into oh, workforce. Member for I didn't hear any criticism when we put $750 million onto the table for emergency departments across the country. Oh, I didn't hear any objections to that, something that they never did. I didn't hear any the objection from constituents in the electorates of those opposite and in the electorates of our members when we committed to putting $600 million into elective surgery. And I can report to the House that 35,000 procedures— minister, for, minister will resume her seat. The member for Dixon on a point of order. On a point of order, uh, Mr Speaker. The question went to the $42 billion spending package by the government and why there was not one dollar toward those hospitals in the $42 billion announced by the, by the Prime Minister. The member, for Dixon, the member for Dixon will resume his seat. I would suggest that he review the latter part of his question. The, member for, the Minister for Health has the call. 
Thank you. I will get to the question of the Dubbo Hospital in a moment, but let me first report to the House Order. that I haven't heard people uh, complaining about the extra 35,000 plus procedures, <coughs> hips, knees, cataracts, that were paid for by this government's investments in its first days in office that have now been delivered across the country, yeah. more than were promised. But let me, let me go particularly let me go particularly to the question of the Dubbo Hospital, because it is a very bad situation. And I have, in answer order, to order. previous questions in the House, made clear that we do not uh, uh, and are not apologists for what is clearly an inadequate situation at that hospital. Order. But I would like order. to read. I would like to uh, read a quote to the House. Um, because it seems that sometimes those opposite don't like to uh, hear my views on these things, but I wondered whether they might like to hear the member for Dixon's view and his comments last week on 2SM. It will be very interesting for you because he said, and I quote, this is uh, 2SM radio last week, the issues at Dubbo Hospital of course have been around for a while. The hospital and the public health issues in general have been around, frankly, for the last 10 years. <laughs> We've done more in the last year than you ever did. Minister, for, Minister resume his seat. The Member for Dixon on a point of order. On a point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to clarify it. For the last 10 years, well, Labor's been in New South Dixon Wales, Dixon and they've ripped patients off. It. The member for Dixon. The House will come. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. The member for Dixon is reminded that that is not a point of order and the Speaker's tolerance is getting very stretched. The Minister has concluded. The member, the, the minister for Trade. The member for Morton has the call. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House on the opportunities for members to play a role in the rollout of the Building the Education Revolution initiative? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Morton for his question and know that he's deeply interested in education in his electorate. And can I say to the member for Morton Order. and can I say Order. to all members in this parliament who are in touch with their local schools that our new program for building the education revolution, our 14.7 billion dollar program, a historic investment in every school in this country, in every primary school, in every secondary school, in every special school, that this new investment offers opportunities for members of parliament who are in touch with the schools in their community to assist. And of course, members who are in touch with their local schools know what their local schools' infrastructure needs are. And they know that local principals, local teachers and parents have seen yesterday's announcement and now want to start working it through. And of course, members of parliament who are in touch with their local communities can play a role in getting that information to school communities. And I would recommend to members of parliament in touch with their local communities that they visit the departmental website, my department's website, where in the building the, ed the education revolution section they will find <coughs> fact sheets to assist schools to work out how their school benefits from this program. And of course the benefits of this program are enormous for local schools but so are the opportunities for supporting local jobs as people get about the construction and repair and maintenance activities that will be financed by this historic new investment in schools. 
And of course, the government is anxious to work with in-touch local members on this program, and we are anxious to work with those who want to assist with the rollout of the program. And in that regard, I would refer to the statement of the Premier of Western Australia, the Liberal Premier, uh, Mr Colin Barnett, who said, and I quote, the federal government's plan, that's our nation building and jobs plan, emphasises the areas of housing and education, two areas that I'm confident the Western Australian government can help to deliver. And then, of course, the uh, Liberal Treasurer in Western Australia, Mr Buswell, said, and I quote, that type of stimulus, whether it impacts on consumption expenditure or investment, is something that the state government welcomes. People who are clearly prepared to work with the federal government in delivering these new investments for Australian schools and, more broadly, through our nation building and jobs plan. Of course, there are then those members of parliament who are so out of touch with the needs of their local school communities that they are opposed to this $14.7 billion investment into schools to make sure that they are able to meet the needs of the 21st century and offer a world-class education. Now, the Leader of the Opposition earlier today was inviting members of parliament to imagine what would they would say looking into the eyes of school children as they talk to them about Australian politics and about matters that involve the Australian nation? In touch, members of parliament will be able to say that we are making an historic investment in their schools and their future. Out of touch, members of parliament from the Liberal Party who are voting against it presumably will say they were members of a government that used to have a program called Investing in Our Schools, which they brought to an end by way of prime ministerial press release on 19 February 2007, that they then contested an election in 2007 without promising one dollar more to that program. And then, in his response today, his, uh, the Leader of the Opposition floated an idea that maybe $3 billion could be put into that program, but failed to explain that's an 80 per cent cut on what the Rudd Labor government is committed to, a nation building and jobs plan for every school in the country, as opposed to the Liberal Party investing in our schools program brought to an end by the then Prime Minister by way of media release on 19 February 2007. The member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to reports which show 93 per cent of small businesses are under cash flow stress. Prime Minister, how does your government expect small business to take advantage of the increase announced yesterday in business investment allowance if 93 per cent of small businesses don't have the cash to invest? The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And the government uh, has been um, working its way through a range of options to try and assist the small business community across Australia who are bearing the brunt of this global economic crisis. Small business is extremely important. It generates employment of a large order of magnitude across the country. There are millions of small businesses. Each of our communities, each of our communities is well represented by the men and women of small business uh, who are out there putting often their houses on the line in support of their small businesses and generating jobs for themselves and incomes to support their families. These small business uh, men and women have not caused this crisis, not one bit. That's been caused by other factors which have been the subject of debate here and elsewhere. The practical question we face is how can we support those businesses? And what we have done so far is implement a range of measures which assist, do not remove or eliminate the impact of the global economic recession on them, but assist in reducing that impact. One of those measures has been derided uh, uh, almost universally by those opposite, and I refer there to the measures we've taken to support private consumption. Small business operators, as the honourable member will know from the Gold Coast, are very much concentrated, not exclusively, but concentrated in the retail sector. Therefore, when you provide direct stimulus to consumption, it flows through in large part to retail. 
The measures, the statistics referred to by the Treasurer before about what happened with the retail sales figures at the end of last year reflect therefore a direct flow through to small business operators. It is not the end of the story. It means that more measures must be taken. But we are acutely conscious of the fact that small business out there at the front arm of retail are bearing so much of the brunt of this impact and therefore our direct support for consumption last year and this year is a direct relevance to them. Secondly, when it comes to the stability of the financial system and the ability of banks to provide credit at all, and I'll go to the question of the extent to which banks are properly providing credit to small business in a minute, the first and foremost responsibility of this government, and given the extraordinary events of last September and October, was to ensure the continued stability of the financial system, period. In this country, uh, our overwhelming focus has been on what we needed to do to make sure that Australia's main commercial banks remain viable into the future. If you look across the world and what has happened with the mainstream banks and other major Western economies as they have fallen like ninepins, 30 of them either collapsed or have had to be bailed out by governments. That is of fundamental and continuing concern to this government, hence the actions we took and which were in large part opposed by those opposite in the double guarantees that we provided both to depositors and to banks for interbank lending. Why have we provided uh, support for interbank lending so that oh, order the member for Moncrief on a point of order Mr Speaker whilst this is a general meander through the government's response the order. fact is that my question was specific about the initiative announced yesterday order. the prime minister has been speaking for 6 minutes and is yet to address in any way the question order. i asked prime minister is responding to the question prime minister uh, mr speaker um, and I'll come to the measure announced yesterday, which uh, relates to the accelerated investment allowance uh, once I've described the impact of supporting banks and their ability to provide credit, period. You see, the debate in this parliament about what we do on stimulus is important. It goes to the questions of government direct action supporting jobs and also government direct action in building necessary infrastructure in our schools and elsewhere. But in the overall global scheme of things, what happens with the normalisation of private credit markets is of fundamental importance. If we don't get that right globally, then stimulus can only do so much, even global stimulus, macroeconomic, including both fiscal and monetary policy measures. It's getting global credit markets operating again, which uh, is so fundamental to allowing credit to flow again at reasonable price to small business borrowers as well. That is why we are so actively engaged in the whole uh, the whole exercise of ensuring the continued stability of our major banks and our overall financial system. Also what has been criticised by those opposite our direct engagement in a measure with the banks uh, to support the uh, private commercial property market. Those opposite need to reflect on this. In the event of the withdrawal of foreign participation in the syndication associated with the commercial property markets, as the Leader of the Opposition audibly groans, what you are effectively signing up to by opposing that is to allow the collapse in asset values of so many of the major companies of this country who have substantial investments in the commercial property sector. That sector alone employs some 150,000 people and the number of small business contractors directly affected by any such collapse in their asset values over which, over which the member for merchant banking, otherwise called the leader of the opposition, uh, seems to be completely oblivious and disregarding of. On the measure that we announced yesterday, which goes to, which goes to the investment allowance, we have, specifically, we have specifically embraced measures to reduce uh, the uh, overall threshold of that which uh, small business can apply uh, for uh, their, uh, their uh, handling through the measure that we have uh, embraced before the threshold was 10,000. Now it's been reduced to 1,000. We have also increased the actual amount uh, from 10 per cent to 30 per cent. We are acutely mindful of the decisions which small businesses have, must make. On the supply of credit and the cost of credit to small businesses, as I also said yesterday, we will remain heavily engaged with the banking sector to do whatever we physically can to support the proper flow of private credit to small businesses as they need it. Mr. Speaker, small business, together with other sectors of the economy, are critical and represent a critical focus of what the government seeks to do. We are engaged in a grave debate in this parliament about how Australia should respond to this global economic crisis. And what stuns me about the debate today 
and the position taken by the leader of the Liberal Party is that the Liberals, demonstrating how much they have lost touch with the Australian community and economy, are now threatening in the Senate to block, block tax bonuses to 8.7 million Australians to block the biggest single, the biggest single building program across Australia's 7,500 primary schools, and frankly, they should reconsider Order. their position. Order. Has the, oh, has the Prime Minister concluded? The member for Capricornia. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. What has been the response to new investment in social housing in yesterday's Nation Building and Jobs Plan? Minister, what positive effects will this have on keeping construction workers in Capricornia employed after the recent layoffs in the mining industry? The Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Capricornia. I know that she has been very concerned about recent job losses in the mining sector and is very concerned to keep construction strong in Capricornia. Mr Speaker, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan released yesterday includes an historic investment in social housing, which will have benefits right across the nation, in areas like hers, in regional centres, in rural and remote areas, in suburbs and cities right across this nation. We'll be building 20,000 new homes and uh, renovating another 2,500 run-down homes to make them livable again. Mr Speaker, this is the largest single investment in social housing ever made by an Australian government. The package will help us meet our targets on homelessness and provide affordable housing for low-income Australians who are struggling in the private rental market. We've had uh, unremarkably, I suppose, very strong in endorsements from the community and welfare sector. The Council to Homeless Persons has said this is great news for the more than 100,000 Australians who are homeless. The Brotherhood of St Lawrence has said we haven't seen this kind of government investment in social housing for decades. Not only will it bring lasting benefit in terms of protecting construction jobs, but it will also boost the stock of affordable housing for disadvantaged Australians now and into the future. ACOS have said we are delighted that social housing has been given a much needed boost. But, Mr Speaker, it's also the fact that this package makes great economic sense. It will support jobs in the housing and construction industry. The Housing Industry Association says the spot purchase of private sector new dwellings will provide a rapid and necessary boost to economic activity. It will activate the commencement of many approved private sector dwellings that have stalled due to a lack of working capital. The Property Council of Australia says Every dollar that goes into construction has a multiplier effect. It is spent three times over in the economy. This makes for an ideal measure of a well-thought-out stimulus package. The Residential Development Council. In committing this money to the sector, the government is ensuring projects that are already in the development pipeline are built and, more importantly, that new projects get off the ground, which is difficult in the current market. Mr Speaker, this measure is right for our economy. It's right for building our nation in the long term. The opposition's decision to block these measures will be a blow to the many low-income Australians who are struggling to put a roof over their heads. And it will be a blow to the construction sector, to all those tradies, small businesses, building supply companies that are struggling to keep their heads above water and struggling to keep their apprentices employed. The responsible thing to do, the compassionate thing to do, is to pass these measures now. The member for Cook. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. Given that the government has already brought forward more than $1.8 billion in projects for homelessness and affordable housing, I might add supported by the opposition, can the minister explain why committing order. the taxpayer— Order! Order! The member for Cook has the call. Talking about your existing project order. programs, the member for Cook Keep will up. ignore the interjections. The interjections will cease. I'll start again, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Given the, the government the has already 
brought forward more than $1.8 billion in projects for homelessness and affordable housing, which the opposition has already supported, can the minister explain why committing the taxpayer to additional $6 billion in debt for public housing is a more effective use of taxpayers' funds than providing support to boost construction for private housing, which represents 97 per cent of residential construction? The Minister for Housing. Order. The member for Banks. Unbelievable. Minister for Housing has the call. Um, Mr Speaker, I guess there's a few things that you can take from that question. The first thing you can take from that question is that the $3 billion cut by the previous Howard government from social housing is their continuing policy. That That's right. the, the fact, Mr Speaker, is that if funding had continued on the trajectory that it had been on under the previous Labor government, we would have 90,000 extra public housing homes in this country today. We've got 100,000 homeless Australians on any given night. 100,000 homeless Australians. If we had continued on the previous trajectory, 90,000 extra for public housing dwellings. That doesn't matter. We'll put that to one side. That doesn't matter. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, the honourable member has asked why we wouldn't spend extra money building private housing. He may have missed the fact that we have set aside $623 million for a national rental affordability scheme. He may Order. have missed the fact that we have set aside $1.5 billion for a first home owner's boost, increasing the first home owner's grant to $14,000 for existing properties, $21,000 for newly built properties. And what do people in the development uh, and construction sectors tell me? They tell me that they are relying, relying on these first home buyers who are walking in off the street with the confidence to buy for the first time in many years because uh, interest rates are low and the first home owner's boost is giving them confidence. They are relying on those first home buyers to keep themselves working. Order. The minister will resume her seat. The member for Cook on a point of Mr. order. Mr. Speaker, on relevance, my question was: Why was it better to spend it in public than on order. private housing? The member why for is it Cook better will spend resume there? his seat. The member for Cook, order. The minister is responding to the question, minister. And Mr. Speaker, I'll conclude by saying it is ironic in the extreme that a party that ignored housing policy for over a decade that presided over a growth in our homeless population at a time of economic prosperity should raise this issue in this way. The member for Parramatta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Will the minister update the House on support for the new Energy Efficient Homes program as part of the government's nation building and jobs plan? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for Parramatta for her question. I know that she takes a keen and acute interest uh, in these policy uh, matters that we are bringing forward for people in her electorate. Uh, as the House would be aware, as part of the government's nation building jobs plan, we've committed $3.9 billion for the Energy Efficient Homes program. That will roll out energy efficiency to Australian suburbs on an unprecedented scale and provide immediate support for green jobs, drive demand in clean and green industries through insulation and hot water. And critically, Mr. Speaker, the energy efficient home programs will also help relieve cost of living pressures for nearly three million dollar Australian homes because it will reduce people's energy bills for years and years to come. And there will be significant savings of some 49 million tonnes, equivalent CO2 by 2020, akin to taking some one million cars off the road. And I'm asked what support there is for the energy efficiency home programs. And I'm pleased to say that the re response has been overwhelmingly positive. And let me read, Mr Speaker, from one ins insulation fitter on ABC Radio yesterday who said, and I quote, our own company had to lay off a shift in one of our plants just before Christmas. We'll be putting that shift back on. Yeah. That's exactly what the Energy Efficient Home Program is about. This is what the Clean Energy Council had to say about the package. I'm happy to read that quote. Insulation saves energy, money, jobs, and the environment, so it's a win-win-win. 
These sort of packages help every Australian by cushioning the cost of transition to a carbon-constrained economy. That's exactly what the Energy Efficient Homes program is about. And here from the Master Builders of Australia, and I quote, this initiative will help support much needed jobs in the building industry, while at the same time assist in reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions and saving energy costs. And it went on to say, boosting the building industry is a proven formula for reviving economies and stimulating jobs growth. And this recognition from the Climate Institute. There's no question that insulation and solar hot water are at the top of the list in improving the energy wastage and carbon pollution from our Australian homes. And Mr Speaker, so these statements of support from the government's announcement yesterday goes on. And this is exactly what the Energy Efficient Home Programs is all about, and it's exactly what these positive responses show. This is the right package to put out at the right time. And Mr Speaker, these programs are already open for business. Order. Action on an unprecedented scale insulation to around 2.7 million Australian households, including half a million rental homes, and by increasing the solar hot water rebate from $1,000 to $1,600 and removing the means test, we're harnessing Australia's abundant, abundant sunshine for a true solar revolution in Australia's suburbs. And, Mr Speaker, we heard another endorsement today, not from a third party, but, as it turned out, from the party opposite. And this is, in fact, what the Leader of the Opposition has said about the government's rollout of insulation. And I quote it, we welcome the government paying attention to insulation, end quote. We then got some overblown criticism, ignoring the fact that the Liberals did nothing for some 12 years before he went on to say, and I quote, the $1,600 subsidy will dot, 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 mean that over 90 per cent of jobs will be completed at no cost to the owner. Well, I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition that's exactly the point. The $1,600 subsidy that the Rudd government will provide for sealing insulation means that over 90 per cent of jobs will be completed at no cost to the owner. That's the point of this particular measure. But he went on to say the subsidy is not means tested. We would support an insulation subsidy of a lower amount. And I would suggest for the government's consideration, one that is, for example, $500 for all houses, increasing to $1,000 subject to a means test. A similar approach could be taken to solar hot water. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's quite incredible. And what must the member for Flinders be thinking? After spending most of last year, after spending most Order. of last year asserting the great injustice Order. of a means test on the $8,000 rebate for solar PV, a rebate that continues to run at record levels, despite the member jumping out of an aeroplane saying that it was in free fall. <laughs> We now have the Leader of the Opposition trying to means test a package that is all about value for money, delivering energy efficiency savings for Australians, nearly three million households on an unprecedented level, and driving the demand for green jobs. Mr Speaker, the Opposition has lost the plot. It's time they supported this bill. The member for Dixon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, nice to be back. Thank you. Uh, my speaker, my, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Ageing. I refer the Minister to reports that not-for-profit aged care providers are refusing to take up placements for high care residents. Minister, with the crisis in aged care, why was not one cent of the government's spending package allocated to help older Australians in need of high care? The Minister for Ageing. Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable for his question. Can I point out to him that this government has, in fact, um, record funding when it comes to aged care, $41 billion over the next four years? And that's in uh, comparison to 12 years of neglect by the previous yeah. government. That's right. But you know what we're always hearing from, uh, from this side, Mr Speaker? They're always talking down the aged care sector. That's what they're always doing. They're always, you're always talking them down. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the honourable member Order. referred to the honourable Order. referred to the uh, the latest aged care approvals round, in which we had very, very healthy and competitive numbers of people applying for those places. 
right throughout the country. Indeed, when it came to uh, higher care, we had a huge amount. When it came to community Order. care, we had a 10 to 1 over subscription. And what it shows is there's a huge interest out there from providers when it comes to applying for those particular places. <coughs> Order. The member for Dixon has asked his question. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank, the, uh, I thank the member for pointing out the issue of the aged care approvals round because I'd also like to, um, to give some information to the House, and that is the uh, latest allocation of capital grants for aged care in the 2008-09 ACAR Creating New Aged Care Places. And indeed, can I say that there is $44.5 million in capital grants towards residential aged care facilities in this year's aged care approvals round. Order. So I thank the member for pointing out the latest round of ACAR in which we had a major oversubscription, in which we're seeing major capital grants to our aged care providers right throughout the country. And Mr Speaker, as I said at the beginning, this government is committed to providing aged care services for our older Australians. Order. 12 years of neglect we had from them, Order. and what we're Member doing, record Gurley. funding, $41 billion over the next four years. Order. We're doing that to provide services to our older Australians where they need and deserve them right throughout this country. The member for Longman. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs, and I ask, Minister, how is the government supporting older Australians during these challenging times? The Minister for Family, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Australians. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, I thank the member for Longman, who, do, who certainly does understand that older Australians who have worked very hard all of their lives are certainly feeling the pressure of the global financial crisis. It is the case, Mr Speaker, that older Australians are amongst the millions who will benefit from the government's $42 billion nation-building and jobs plan. Those uh, self-funded retirees who paid tax in 2007-08 as a result of their investments or other incomes will uh, receive the $950 tax bonus. And part pensioners who paid uh, even $1 in tax last financial year will also receive the $950 tax bonus. So that means around 290,000 older Australians, self-funded retirees and part pensioners can expect to benefit. This, uh, of course, uh, Mr Speaker, is on top of the benefits uh, that were paid to both pensioners and self-funded retirees uh, back in December. Those economic security strategy payments went to four out of five of the 2.8 million Australians aged over 65, both pensioners and self-funded retirees. Of course, very importantly, uh, many pensioners who are suffering in the private rental market will benefit from uh, the government's $6.4 billion investment in social housing. Many, many, of the, uh, uh, pen many pensioners in the private rental market are under severe housing stress, and we certainly hope that some of them will be able to benefit from the 20,000 extra homes that will be built. This support, uh, of course, builds on many other initiatives that the government put in place last year for older Australians. And I think these figures are very important for everybody to be aware of. In total, and this is excluding the normal indexation that pensioners uh, receive, the government has provided an additional $2,337 of assistance to single pensioners and $3,537 to pensioner couples, all that in the year since we came into office. We have certainly also committed to delivering long-term pension reform, and this has been recognised uh, by the uh, National Seniors Chief Executive Officer Michael O'Neill, who said yesterday, and I quote him, I think uh, the relief has come already and there will be a further lot of relief with the reform in May in the budget. 
Well, Mr Speaker, unfortunately for older Australians, there's only one thing standing in the way of them benefiting from this uh, nation building and jobs plan, and that, of course, is the opposition. It's the opposition that's going to prevent self-funded retirees and part pensioners getting the tax bonus uh, it, that uh, we have proposed. He also seems to want to stop those pensioners who are under severe financial stress in the private rental market from getting the, uh, from getting the help that they need. It demonstrates just how out of touch this Leader of the Opposition and the Liberal Party are. They have no intention of making sure that older Australians get the help that they need. The member for Dunkley. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister accept that his failure to get the National Broadband Network project underway, the government's single biggest infrastructure election promise, has deprived the Australian economy of a significant economic stimulus? The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the question uh, just asked uh, by the member for Dunkley reminds me of all other questions posed today by those opposite on the question of national economic infrastructure. And, and it begs one fundamental question. What did you do for 12 years? What did you do on broadband for 12 years? What did you do on building our schools for 12 years? What did you do on building our hospitals for 12 years? What did you do when the investment in our universities went backwards rather than forwards? What did you do to make sure that our research infrastructure was in fact world class? Answer to the above, nothing, nothing, next to nothing, nothing and nothing. That's the answer to each of those questions. And as the member for Dunkley works his way back to the dispatch box, the block it. The member for Dunkley on a point of order. Um, thank you. As a matter of relevance, we're wondering how the NBN stimulus is going. That was the order. question, Prime Minister. The member will resume his seat. Prime Minister will respond to the question. Prime um, Minister. So, Mr Speaker, uh, on the question of, uh, of infrastructure, including broadband infrastructure, uh, the government will stand by each and every one of its pre-election commitments. Uh, these are vital for the nation for the 21st order. century. Because, uh, because our vision for the nation is to ensure that we have 21st century infrastructure. This government stands for nation building. Those opposites stand for sitting on their hands. That's the alternative. And again, I say to those opposite, including to the leader of the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party, by its decision today, demonstrates how out of touch it has come with all Australians and the needs of the Australian economy and Australian families by now threatening to block this nation-building plan in the Senate. So out of touch have they become that they have no mind whatsoever as to who will pay the price of this global economic recession. I tell you who won't be paying the price, it'll be the merchant bankers. Order. Who will be paying the price will be those who are out there depending on this government to act in Stewart. order to fill the gap left by the withdrawal of private sector activity by assisting with the measures that we've announced. Those who will benefit from the package the government has put forward, we have already uh, underlined through the statements the government has made yesterday. But those who will pay the price for this action taken by the Leader of the Liberal Party today are the mums and dads who are facing every day the challenges of paying back to school costs, those out there who Order. are waiting for decent primary school facilities and Order. those out there Order. who expect their governments to act and not just Order. to wave the through Minister, the recession onto their shoulders. Has the Prime Minister concluded? The member for Bass. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors and the Service Economy. Will the Minister advise the House of the response to the government's nation building and jobs plan, in particular to the initiatives that will benefit small business? The Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors and the Service Economy. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I thank the member for Bass for her question and for ongoing support for the Business Enterprise Centre in Launceston and the small business community uh, more generally. I can advise the House, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the response of the small business community to the plan announced yesterday has been extremely positive. Extremely positive. Indeed, the uh, Council of Small Business of Australia described the plan as a confidence boost for small business that will provide benefit to many small businesses and to the communities in which they live and operate. We've heard from the uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Western Australia. What do they say? They describe it as a timely shot in the arm for small business. It says that the $2.7 billion tax bonus that has been criticised by the coalition uh, is an important and timely investment in the lifeblood of the Australian economy, small business. The New South Wales Business Chamber has said that this is a shot in the arm for the New South Wales economy. It says New South Wales businesses will particularly welcome the $2.7 billion package of tax breaks for business. Okay, what do we hear from the master builders of Australia? They have said the building industry is predominantly made up of small businesses, which should benefit from the government's 2.7 billion small business and general tax break. The point they're making, the point they're making is this is a plan for tradies. This is a plan for the tradespeople of Australia, as the Prime Minister pointed out during question time and again this morning. What have you got against the contractors and the tradespeople of Australia? You're supposed to be supporting small business, the tradies and the contractors, but you're opposing each and every one of these measures. The National Farmers Federation, what have they had to say? They say in support of the, of the package, further, the $2.7 billion tax break for small business will be greatly appreciated by those small family-owned farms. Well, it would be appreciated if we could get it through the parliament. And then the Restaurant and Catering Association has said the small business tax break may just be what our small businesses need to convince them to buy that new piece of equipment in the market. There you go, the member for Con There you go, the member for Moncrief. And it says, very importantly, on this question of spending, consumers now spend nearly 10 per cent of their household income on meals out on average, and these additional payments, which will come just prior to the next school holidays, of course, if we could get them through the parliament, will be spent in restaurants and cafes. So there's the Restaurant and Catering Association. Now, the fact is, the only critics of this plan, the only critics of this plan, are members of the opposition. The criticism led last night by the former treasurer, the member for Higgins, who formally began his campaign for the leadership yesterday and last night. And I'll bet we have the member for the opposition who's always taking an each way bet, a bob each way. Well, I'll bet there's a very big chance, and I'll back it on the nose, that the, the member for Higgins, the former treasurer, will oh, be the leader be. of the opposition. Minister, resume your seat. The member for Canning on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, how can this rant be relevant to the question asked? Order. The minister will respond to the question. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm responding to the decision of the opposition to oppose this package. The temporary opposition leader is condemning the Australian people to more hardship, to more job losses, more people losing their homes and more people losing their businesses. He is completely out of touch with the needs of the Australian people. He's completely out of touch with the needs of small business. And I call on the opposition leader to put aside your personal short-term political interests, small, support the small business community of Australia, support the Order. Australian people and support the Australian national interest and pass this package. The member for in, in, the member for Goldstein. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the repeated statements in the months leading into the last election that Labor had a plan for major infrastructure. Prime Minister, after well over a year in office, well over a year in office, and two so-called stimulus packages totalling $50 billion, why have there been no major new infrastructure projects announced to date? The Prime Minister. Um, order. Order. They, uh, Mr. Speaker. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. They really are a bunch of buttes, aren't they? 
on infrastructure. Twelve years, nothing. One year, fix the lot. Okay, that's terrific. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, one year, fix the lot. Trains out across order. the country. Member for There's Goldstein a few things called the, the odd tendering process. The There's a few things Prime called Minister will resume his seat. Prime, Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Order. No. The Member for O'Connor on a point of order. Can I draw your attention to the obligation of speakers, be they at the dispatch box or otherwise, to not only address you through the chair, but not to turn their back upon you order. so they can the play for some O'Connor. computer or The Member TV for O'Connor trick. will resume his seat. The Prime Minister will address his remarks through the chair. The Prime Minister. Well, on the, question, on the question of infrastructure, let us all um, bring close to mind the absolute debacle in the Senate last year when those opposite sought to vote on the nation building That's legislation. Right. Do you remember that? I do you remember that? And I, nice, and, uh, I noticed the uh, honourable member who's just interjected, um, who's from the great state of Western Australia. I thought that after 12 years of um, umpteen studies by those opposite about partnering with the West Australian government on the future development of the ORD, this government uniquely has now said to the government of Western Australia, the Liberal government of Western Australia, we're going to be partners with you in that development. And that's why I went up to Kununurra with the Liberal Premier of Western Australia, because we're going to get on with the business of developing the Great North West, as opposed to those who twiddle their thumbs for year on year on year. Furthermore, I'd say to the member for Goldstein, in answer to his question, on two occasions last year we advanced uh, two blocks of half a billion dollars to the universities of Australia to advance much needed capital works. That work is now underway Order. through planning processes and the rollout of project work. We have done the same in the stimulus package last year. A half a billion dollars released also to the TAFE sector of the country to do the same. I would suggest to the member for Goldstein that he also pays attention to the other contents of the $4.6 billion Nation Building One program that we released last December, including the massive investment in the Australian Rail Freight Corporation and what will happen to the Australian Rail Freight Network across the country. These are decisions which are already been taken, and we support each one of them. Has the Prime Minister concluded? I think I should be charitable and let that just ride. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Will the Minister update the House on the reaction to the government's nation building and jobs plan, including the farmers' hardship payment? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Flynn for, for the question, uh, a member who's well in touch with the farmers in his electorate. It's critical that the government invests in long-term nation-building projects in rural and regional Australia in order to support jobs and boost long-term growth. We referred yesterday to the reaction from the NFF as one of the first farmers' organisations to explain their view of how this would affect farmers in need, where they said the government's $950 tax-free bonus for all drought-affected farmers reaching some 21,500 farmers in need will be a much-needed fillip to families and regional economies. But the most extraordinary thing hasn't been the reaction, the positive reaction from the farmers. The most extraordinary thing has been the reaction from some of the people within this chamber. Because while the member for Flynn understands that there's 550 farming families in need who will receive the $950 payment, I think people were astonished when the member for Wide Bay decided to announce that the more than 130 farming families who would receive the $950 payment in his electorate were going to be told that he would come in here and vote against the $950 payment for those 130 farming families in his electorate. But maybe it's because he didn't consult fully 
with the other members of the National Party and Liberal Party in this chamber, who have many more than 130 families who have received the benefit, but have now been committed to come into this chamber and vote against them receiving that benefit. I mean, did he consult with the member for Parks, who will have more than 800 farming families in his electorate, who he's going to walk in here and vote that they don't get the $950? Did he consult with the member for Murray, who has more than 1,900 farming families in her electorate, who Order. will come in here and vote against it? Did he think for a moment about the electorate of Mallee and the extraordinary challenges, the extraordinary challenges that are happening in areas like Mildura, where there are more than 2,150 farming families who will receive the $950 payment? and yet he will vote against. But the members for Flynn, the members for Blair, the members for Eden Monero, for Wakefield, for Ballarat, for Bendigo and Karangamite will come in here and defend the farming families in their electorates. Did we think about the member for Gippsland who campaigned, who campaigned during his by-election that he would support the upgrade of the Mafra Secondary College? And yet, and yet, when money is going to come forward to help fund, to help fund the up, an upgrade at Mathra Secondary College, that he's been committed now to come in here and vote against it. Order. Or maybe, Order. Or maybe, Those maybe the member right. for Gippsland, maybe the member for Gippsland ought to have a look over his shoulder at someone who was elected on the by-election in another part of Australia on the same day, because the member for Lyon campaigned. He campaigned vigorously for the upgrade of Loriton Primary School, and he'll be able to come in here and defend his local primary school and vote in favour of it. Order. Mr. Speaker, Order. there are three political parties in this room. The political Order. party in this room Order. that represents the fewest country seats is, without surprise, the National Party. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there is a reason for that. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, on that note, and Hockey Joe having had a bit of trouble rustling up a few more questions, we ask that further Order. questions be placed on the notice paper. Order. 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 The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Order the Leader of the House. The Member for Barker again.